What's happening? Um, you just realized that nothing was recording on VMix. Ah, so I'm fixing. All right, it right Andrew, now. if you can hear us, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Um. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right. So there's that. How about that? that? No. How about that? Hello. Hi. No echo. Justin. Hello. Check check. Andrew. Oh, you know what? I do remember. It was this. Try 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 try. So basically, I just need to make sure this does not feed back in. You hear us in the jet. Deedle-dee-doo. Doddle-dee-da. 
Okay, so at this point, you and I could be heard. Andrew, the moment I do this, I think we can. Well, wait, hold on. Oh, we can hear you. Wait, hold on. Wait, can Andrew be heard? Andrew cannot be heard. He cannot because he's muted. Try, 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 try. 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 Right, okay. So if I remember correctly, um, try again, Andrew. I, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the Google setup that needed a special output for Andrew. And I'm pretty sure I can do it. Nope. Huh? Uh, let me go to out. Five, six, and instead it should be one eight. Let's try that. And then I can turn this on. Andrew, are you there? Andrew. 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 No. Andrew. 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 So maybe I change the inputs on the Google chat. On the Google chat. On the Google. There you go. Oh, no, no. Okay, uh, Justin, you can hear me, right? I can. Okay, and I can hear you. Yeah. And then I'm gonna. Andrew, can you hear this? No. Andrew, can you hear this? Andrew, can you hear this? Okay, so that tells me I'm sending you the wrong stuff. Andrew, can you hear this? Andrew.
Uh, 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 Andrew, can you hear this? And okay, so the VMAX channel box only return. I must return. Andrew, can you hear me? Andrew, can you hear me? No. And Drew, can you hear this? So you're saying hello. Yo, 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 yo. yo. no. Andrew? Hello? Yes. Are we doing... Anybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I hear you, Brian, but do you hear me? I do hear you, and there's no echo. I hear you saying you hear me, but do you really hear me? I do hear you. Uh, parsimony. Parsimony, Andrew. Oh, man. Now I get the Yentl joke. <laughs> uh, Jesus. That's a deep Justin, cut. Justin, which one are you on? Boop, 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 boop. Okay. Uh, so, okay. so this, is, this is the one where we all hear each other and it goes through vmix and vmix is recording and vmix is translating for future reference viewers this is uh scene zero two g n v b a n b b b got it all right I like that Brian's just going to ask the crowd to remember this instead of putting it to a notepad. You know what? Actually, you could take a picture of it. That's that's a legit point. Wait, well, a picture I think will get lost, but I no, will. No, I just like that. You're just, it's up to you, audience. It's up to the world to save this information. The picture might get lost, fault. but at least it'd be on your phone at all times. Oh, yeah. I take pictures of everything. All right. Fair point. Okay. At the very least, Siri can do a search of pictures from Friday afternoon. <laughs> and then we can do that. Uh, okay. All right. Well, here, let's get the show started. Thank you for your patience. Here we go. Nice. I don't think I want to be around anymore. <laughs> All right. And three, two.
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Oh my goodness, just a producer extraordinaire. I know. Well, you're made of many talents, Brian. Doesn't matter how thinly they're spread, there are many talents. <laughs> There's something there. Uh, <laughs> you know, what else is something? We have Justin Robert Young back in the studio. Hey! Hey, I'm back. back. I'm back and better back. than ever. So I, I heard that you got our special birthday wish campaign trail message. I did. I did get a very, very special birthday wish from uh, the one and only depressed Oompa Loompa of uh, the Willie's chocolate experience. Uh, it was uh, quite amazing. We played it at the beginning. I, I got it right before we were, we recorded We're Not Wrong last week. So the uh the episode last week of of where not wrong is where you want to go to uh to 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 see the full clip but it was uh it was amazing it was truly an an experience and it it was it was a a, a very very heartening moment that for that class of person who finds themselves amidst internet celebrity this felt like the cleanest way that they could make money and and the good news for that young woman uh, of doing an absolutely horrifyingly shoddily produced production is that it doesn't take much to make a real super realistic set that looks exactly like the <laughs> shoddy production that you were a part of. It looked amazing. It looked, like, it looked like she shot at a meat freezer. So I was uh, not going to lie, sitting on the John, and I see this article about, you know, that the, the, this the Oompa Loompa's on Cameo. And I could not fast enough on my phone type in to order you your birthday wish on there. I was ah. like, like, I'm like, I was just like, not even wait to get on my computer. I'm like, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. I gotta gotta get this for Justin. So turnaround time was really fast. She was great. Very very happy about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, her commitment to character ten out of ten. Her Scottish brogue eleven out of ten. It's just amazing. Just, she 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 is you, a Glasgow native, man. Yeah, uh, the so, thing so, uh, you're not ready for. From from what I'm hearing, it sounds like uh, uh, you got a cameo from yep. one of the characters of Willie's Chocolate Experience. The 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 terrible abomination. Yeah, that was overhyped and bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, overhyped is a weird way to say it because it's certainly true that it was overhyped, but it wasn't particularly like hyped. It wasn't like there were people uh, jumping up and down and screaming, "You get a, you got to go to this thing." It was just sort of a regular old kids' experience, and boy, did it so under deliver that overhyped still matters. We hear comical sound effects off screen. <laughs> uh, not gonna lie, have a little spider duty here. I, I just, ah, just uh, got you, got you, got you. Not, not gonna take it. Not gonna sit here. Not for you all. Let them just sit there and stare at me while I'm doing the show. I'm sorry. This is for fans only. Arachnids not allowed. Get not allowed. Get out of here, you eight-legged freaks. So so what, what, so, what was the cameo? Uh, it was uh, uh, on the same set. I mean, I, I guess uh, 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 Andrew, do you have it handy, or or should I try to find it uh, to I send can get to Brian? It in a second. Send All right, to Brian. so I'll, I'll I'll fill it in. But uh, uh, for folks who are only going to listen to this, the uh, imagine the exact picture that you first saw the uh, uh, depressed Oompa Loompa. And by the way. Having heard a uh, uh, read interview uh, interviews with this woman, uh, I think it is very, very important to her that she is the depressed Oompa Loompa, not the meth Oompa Loompa, not the Breaking Bad Oompa Loompa. <laughs> she, so she's already branding. She's already oh, nailing. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the interview that I read of her was like, it was really funny. A lot. Me and my friends are laughing about it. Uh, uh, everybody should find it funny. Less thrilled that people were calling me a meth head <laughs> like that's not <laughs> not the nicest she, thing in the world so so d depressed oompa loompa is the proper nomenclature yeah and i've seen her and her name's kirsty patterson i've seen her in interviews she's a beautiful young woman and uh very seems like very you know charismatic very engaging so 
the I, I get that, you know, because that photo of like had to be taken, the photo of the the meth oompa loompa stressed middle of the day, yes. any situation. Like I think about the number, I think about the number of times I've had like set photos taken of me ah. where I'm like behind the scenes and I, I just literally look like a pale ape, you know, yeah. just lumbering in the corner. So uh Hats off to her. So I sent Brian the the clip there if you want to take a look. But so those of you who don't know, Cameo is this service where you can get celebrities to send like birthday wishes, you know, motivational things, whatever. And it's really kind of a neat thing because, you know, for, uh, you know, pricing variable from 25 bucks, maybe to a couple hundred bucks. But to have somebody that you you like or whatever and say something cool, a special message is really neat. You know, part about a celebrity, our fascination with it is we want their attention. And this is a really way, easy way for them to say, okay, I will give you attention or direct it to where you want within these terms. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is, this is the cameo video. Hello, Justin. It's your favorite Oompa uh, here. Good luck in your political journey and your podcast from your favorite Willy Wonka, depressed, and pull and pull. <laughs> oh, So very, very deliberate on the word depressed. Yes, yeah. yes. No, she is She is the depressed Oompa Loompa, and uh, she's my favorite Oompa Loompa. All the rest <laughs> of them in the movie and the new movie, all of them sit down. Sorry, buddy. You are uh, uh, getting up behind the depressed Oompa Loompa because none of you guys have wished me a happy birthday, and she has. So, so number one Oompa Loompa in my heart. <laughs> yeah. And good on her and some of the other ones. So that there is a couple of the characters that were from that. There's another Oompa Loompa there, which was, I forget the other. If you go to Cameo, you can see because there's another girl who played an Oompa Loompa. And then for a brief time, a character that was created apparently from this AI generated script, which when you read hear the parts of the script, you go, Yeah, that feels like Chad GPT3. They talked about the unknown, and the unknown was somebody wearing a mirror mask and a black robe that would just jump out from behind the little kids from behind a mirror, which actually sounds kind of awesome. Yeah. Um th th and, this was this like, was original IP. Ori like this was yeah. not from from the roll doll uh uh Willy Wonka lore. Uh, uh, like like the Oompa Loompa. This this was a, a straight OG original. Wait, 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 then, wait, where should I search for this? Did you search? Well, the unknown popped yeah. up on Cameo, then they're gone. Apparently, the unknown was a sixteen year old girl that had to work all day because they didn't have another unknown costume. Oh no! I just that's so funny. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I yeah, mean, the, yeah. The the, the no, unknown. Man. You can probably just Google. Uh, 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 yeah, the I, I, I just. Did uh, the unknown, um, <laughs> and there's an article saying <laughs> yeah. bizarre Willy Wonka mirror character explained, <laughs> and so it's just a 16 year old girl running around with a with a mirror, with a mirror, a mask, and a Gene Simmons wig. <laughs> <laughs> that's her hair. <laughs> oh, that's her real hair. Yeah. What is that? It's the unknown. <laughs> uh, and you know like five months we're gonna get the netflix stock there's already a musical that somebody's put on about this it's just that you know the people with the willy wonka ip and they just did the movie are looking at this going like what did we do wrong exactly <laughs> that's amazing uh, so exciting news uh, absolutely congrats to Elon Musk and the team at SpaceX because guess what? Starship yesterday Starship. went up, took off, made it into separation phase, and it, they didn't do it, wasn't supposed to go into orbit. So it did a suborbital, but they reached orbital velocities and did a successful launch and separation and reached space. They actually reached the largest object to be ever put by humans into space. So they straight up uh, passed the Kármán line the whole nine yards? Yep, yep. Uh, wait, wait, did you say orbit? No, suborbital. Suborbit, sub okay. But, okay, but, but, okay. But, they, but they reached orbital speeds. Yeah. Uh, did Okay, uh, here's the part I always worry about. Did it land? No, was not really this mission profile. The the profile was really 
to see if they could try to decelerate into the ocean. And I don't think, I think the booster came back and I think the booster just, they were just trying to do ditches into the ocean for both. They may have been trying as a, as a stretch goal to see if they could relight and get that to happen. But this was purely, can we get the thing into space? They got it in space. I mean, uh, that's, that's pretty big. Last time I checked, uh, they made entire movies about that, uh, capability. Yeah. And, they put Starlink dishes on there and uh, star transmitters, so they were able to basically communicate and send video from all the way up. So if you go to their some, you know, they, they don't put their video on. I don't. Maybe they put some of this video on YouTube, but they they're trying to promote this other platform X. Oh, but oh. Uh, it is quite quite an amazing achievement. And so, congrats to them. And so, it's just. Very, very, very cool that they did that. So let's see if we go type in Starship into Google search. We'll see some of the other coverage. So it's what's if you're if you're a big fan of space and you want to follow somebody who's obsessively covering it is Tim Dobb, the everyday astronaut. They have literally like a whole house they have rented out. They have their own tracking gear. They basically built, you know, network quality facility for being able to track and watch these launches. And so it's just amazing to see somebody who has been very passionate about something professionally keep growing and growing and growing to the point that if you want coverage on it, Tim's going to give you better coverage than any of the news orgs. So this uh, I think is the, scroll back up, Brian. I think the, I these, back up. these are all, uh, <laughs> These are all uh, uh, out of Texas. This this line. Brian, I'm pretty sure we passed it. Before. I'm pretty sure it was back up there. <laughs> don't don't you do so. Well, let me see. We are looking at rockets. Oh, uh -huh. let's. Oh, dear. oh no. <laughs> For audio listeners, Brian's been served very specific ads. For very sexy ladies. <laughs> Brian, how dare the, you? The algorithm uh, knows cookies. only can tens I, can and I above. Your cookies, <laughs> <laughs> only tens and above. <laughs> also, this is a work computer, so this. Oh, I'll have bet even... you. <laughs> uh, I pro tip: this somebody told me this. I don't know if this is useful or not. Uh, be sure to clear out your Safari like saved bookmarks because sometimes you go click on a link and accidentally save it when you don't mean to, and oh. you go look in that bookmarks folder and you find, oh my god, look at those bookmarks. Mm. So good to know. Just, just saying for anybody out there. Uh, my friend told me this. <laughs> uh, Starship. <laughs> yeah. So uh, amazing achievement. So what does this mean? The goal of Starship, there's several steps ahead they need to do. They need to recover the booster. They need to recover the, the, the spacecraft. But they were able to get this thing into space. That is a very, very big deal. So it's going to be an iterative process. And thanks to the SpaceX way of doing things is step by step. The next step is going to be, hey, let's you know go ahead and see if we can't you know land the booster back onto the pad. Let's see if we can get the Starship back. Because that's you know, the goal of reusability. But I think that they're very well funded. They're very, very focused on what they want to do. You know, by the time something launches, they already know how to build the improved version, which is one of the things I think that, that their, their design method should really be studied by a lot of people. The idea is they, they capitalize themselves in such a way. This wasn't initially. I mean, even initially, though, they had a couple Hail Marys. They thought they were going to run out of money, and they were able to get one more rocket and manage to get that into orbit and get their contracts. But it is a smart thing to think about is – this is a thing that's common in many tech businesses. You're, you're going to succeed. Success is partially a formula of how much you get to learn and how many experiments you get to run. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like to think of it, and maybe this is more of an after things topic, but it's like it's just clock cycles. It's iteration. It's, it's running through the paces over and over and over again. Yeah, I, I think so. But I think it's like, and I would add to that, is – having that that feedback if you're not getting data every time you do it then it's not it's not useful and that's an it sounds like an obvious thing but cuz to us but do you have to think about that when i knew i wanted to become an author i said i need to write 10 books but i wasn't just going to write 10 books in a row i'd write a book then i'd read a book on writing and then the next book i would think about that when i wrote my next book and then i'd write a book and read a book on writing and start to do these postmortems you start to analyze that so every time you get those improvements just doing things out of repetition with no feedback loop for information 
you may never make progress. And I think that's a problem with a lot of things is that we often just repeat the same things over and over again, but we're not really analytical. You know, Peter Thiel tells, says that he thinks that we, we fetishize failure too much, <laughs> that we, you know, maybe we should just pay more, more only attention to why things are successful. And I get what he's trying to mean, mean by that is that like, uh, uh, there, when you're trying to learn from these things, um, everything's going to have a reason for failure. The reasons for success might be fewer than we realize. Yeah, but, I, I think I think in his world of of the VC stuff, I I get that in that some people can be, uh, you know, repeat. Uh, uh, you know, they 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 come back and get two or three different chances because there's a lot of very very good explanations for failure, and it's like, oh, well, you learned a lot, and it's like, well, maybe sometimes. Yeah, you know, but, but 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 the success ultimately defines you. Yeah. So it's it's really an exciting thing. I think that's funny too. Is that yesterday we lobbed the largest rocket ever into space? Yeah, and we're like, oh, and we're like, oh, it's cool. Yeah, you know, and that's it's funny because that kind of uh, uh, goes to where sort of uh, uh, Elon Musk is now. It's like he did two things that were thought to be impossible. Uh, build a space company and build an American car company. Uh, he did both, but now they're both just kind of like wallpaper. They're very cool. Our our society and our world is better because of it. But uh, you know, now the most exciting thing about them is you know the tweets. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, uh, it, it, it's remarkable. I mean, it's it's it, it's a credit to his success that that these things exist. But also, that's you know, <laughs> see that tweet. Hey, Elon Musk, uh, hello, man on the street. We're doing an interview. Uh, Elon Musk, who's he? The tweet guy. The tweet man. He tweets. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's a, it's a, it's a complicated legacy. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think it's just the reality that all news fades. And it doesn't matter what the news is. All, all news becomes old, and uh, uh, we are blessed to live in times where uh, uh, we got a lot of news. Cool things happen yeah. all the time. Yeah, I, I one of the things I you know realized is I have a <laughs> believe it or not, guys, I'm very opinionated. Um, but outside these microphones and our phone calls and my Twitter and my social media, I'm very careful, not, not out of fear, but like, I want to be focused about what I talk about. Yeah. I mean, do, that's do, a thing. Do, that, do you, uh, uh, I, maybe it's too early to talk about it, but it's like, I feel like that with the, the diaspora of everybody going to, you know, their blue skies and their mastodons and their threads and all that stuff. It does feel safer around here here being where the internet well how do you mean hmm. i mean i mean like there was a hot minute where it's like every single post felt like a liability and that that wasn't fun are you saying the hall monitors have all moved to different places i i'm well, I'm, I'm i'm saying that it's not as easy to create a critical nexus that causes a lot of trouble and that you can, uh, the same thing that grabbed us all attention, uh, of being wild and, you know, crazy guys early on, uh, became a liability at some point. And it, it, it does feel like it's safer nowadays. I, and maybe I think a thing that happened too, was that if somebody said a dumb tweet, and I decided that I was going to go call this person out for their dumb tweet. People are going to be very quick to go scrutinize my tweet history. And I yeah. think that we saw some very prominent, uh, you know, people ringing the shame bell from uh, Game of Thrones. All of a sudden, people are like, well, you did this. And it's like, well, that's different because it's me. And I think we saw a bit of that where it was the kind of that we realized that, you know, we all live in glass houses. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, uh, Eventually, <laughs> the uh, uh, the the canceling reaper comes for all of us. <laughs> yeah, and, oh my god! And I think yeah. we've all had our fill of it. <laughs> I had I had a conversation the other day with some neighbors. They're talking about you know some local kids in the high school here that were in the back of the car and made a video where they said inappropriate racial things, 
joking as kids do. And they're like, oh, why didn't, and it went viral. And they're like, why didn't the father say anything? Why did he do anything that's like this? And I'm like, but there for the grace of God go I for all this dumb stuff that I have said taken out of context that I'm like, I'm not going to yell. I think that, yeah, these kids, this is, you know, you know, I said also I was trying to make these things aren't real to them. Like I was trying to explain these adults, like these things aren't real to them. You know, like that they, they never met a person. They're not, they don't normally know somebody who grew up through segregation or understand like that struggle and what went through. So like, you know, they're given this, it's like kids born, born post nine 11, like, like, man, you all are traumatized about something. And it's like, well, yeah. And for them, it's different. And it's just hard for, I think, a generational thing to understand these things are different to kids. Yeah. And uh, oh, cancel them anyways. <laughs> <laughs> More grist for the mill. We sacrifice I mean, at dawn. I mean, Justin, if you had had, I, I think, you know, <laughs> How quickly would you have been canceled? Oh, yeah. well, uh, why are you doing? <laughs> no, yeah, no. I, I uh, uh, look. There's stuff out there now that uh, uh, doesn't age well, or, or you know, that people uh, could say, "Hey, look at this thing that you said on the internet," uh, and it's like, yeah, I, I was a, a, a kid who loved certain comedians and loved. Uh, talk radio, which at that point was very much through an arc of of, of shock jock. So uh, there's there's stuff that said, and you know, I I, I don't know. Uh, uh, you always ask you to defend yourself here. Well, no, I, I'm no, I'm thinking because yeah. like uh, of the mechanism of it. The the yeah, biggest yeah. thing that cancel culture kind of came for were very entrenched but top heavy leadership uh, cultures. So yeah. academia, media, places where one or two people can make a decision and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody gets excised or blah, 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 blah. Uh, you combine that with everybody getting up to speed on what the internet means and what it doesn't mean while everything else in media is collapsing. So the traditional barometers for uh, what people care about are kind of gone. Uh, and that yeah. leads us to the place that we were then yeah as to the the crimes the sins they'll always change like like we we, we yeah. went through a a particular period of like oof didn't age well but there's nothing to say that in 10 years we won't be like ah remember the great classic comedy of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh these these people we we don't know culture uh, waxes and wanes and and it, it it depends on on a lot of different stuff like the one thing that i think is disingenuous is to insinuate that nothing has ever changed that i think is yeah. is that that is disingenuous to to suggest that like no it's unfair to say but the rules changed on me you're right the rules do change it's not nice or fair but that often happens uh, just don't gaslight and say like this is the way it's always been. It's like no, we live in a weird no. society. So I've got good news for you. What's that? We might be able to replace this weird society with robots. Oh damn, them cancelable robots. Yep. Ah, uh, listen, listen. Like uh, you don't like your friends replaced with robots. That's what you can do now. Yeah, uh, Brian, I sent you a clip. Uh, which is a company figure AI. Uh, full disclosure, they have a partnership with OpenAI, but I'm no longer at OpenAI, so since it's obviously um, uh, I have no lo- bias whatsoever. But. Loading it up right now, boss. There we go. Uh, so figure AI is is really doing some very cool things with robotics. One of the things they're doing now is they're merging chat GPT with robots, and basically we're going to watch it perform a really interesting task, and it's going to talk to you, and I want to get your take on this. So it's a shiny chrome a steelish looking robot in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great. Can I have something to eat? Just kills him. <laughs> sure thing. Wow. So we're seeing extremely precise finger movements. Great. Can yeah. you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? Holy moly. On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. It even does the vocal stammer. Yeah. 
Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? Oh my God. Oh my God. The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them there? Of course. So this is really... Oh my God, I'm, I, I, forgive the silence audio listeners. Um, this is astonishing. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. Holy moly! When, when did this release? This video came out two days ago. So what, what makes this cool is GPT-4 since last year has had vision capabilities. And I've, I've helped a little bit with some people working on machine learning, machine vision tasks and some robotics companies. I have nothing to do with this company. Um, uh, I put out a post, by the way, a couple of days ago, correcting a research paper that said that there was this limitation in visual reasoning. I showed with a little tweak on their prompt, you could improve it like 95%. So what they're doing here is they're using GPT-4 vision, which is GPT-4's vision capability, with their existing robotics hardware and their, their, their own software. The idea is the GPT-4V can look at a scene and say, oh, yeah, that's an apple, that's trash, that's this, whatever. And then it could figure out, I need to put X over here, do this there. Then their robotic software carries over. And it's this wonderful integration between the reasoning of a GPT-4-level system with the be able to embody something in physical space that can actually carry out a task that has the fine dexterity to do these things. And so uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to name companies, but this may be something owned by somebody who we may have mentioned previously in the show. They did a demo where they showed a robot folding a shirt, yeah. which everybody was impressed with. Somebody's pointed out, if you look at the lower corner, you see what looks like somebody's hand with a telemetry glove actually controlling it remotely oh, wow. to do the shirt folding, which is uh, makes me anxious if they're going out of their way to fake demos like that, because that is a fake to me. That is a, I'm not going to show you this thing over there. So we're here, figure AI, like, by all accounts, like, you see, they let the pauses in there. They're showing you it's the GPT-4 waiting to respond, you know, as it does a thing. They didn't try to speed it up as far as I can tell. I think this Wait, was a it, very, it, very fair demo. And it, 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 a, a trivial thing, but it sounds like there's a different voice on there. But also, like, the uh, 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 all of the movements and the decisions are 100% congruent with my experience with using the voice chat on GPT-4. Yeah. So so it... it, it uh, uh, I'd be a liar if I said I wasn't surprised, because I was surprised, but also... After watching this, uh, I, I understand why this might not be surprising. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's extraordinarily impressive. And I do agree, Andrew, that uh, especially these days, the, the, the era of the vaporware demo uh, hopefully is, is uh, becoming increasingly passe. We, we are at a moment of show us what you got right now and not show us what you could do in five years. You hear that, Boston Dynamics? Yeah. So it's a long ways from the demo, the lab floor to the production line, but we've talked about this before. We're going to see a huge acceleration in robotics. There are dozens of companies out there working on cool stuff. This is one of them. I think that we're going to see a... Revolution and part of what they did here, which is cool, is marrying the smarts of an LLM like GPT-4 that's multimodal can do vision with their own robotics hardware and software. You let GPT-4 do the high-level reasoning. Hey, yeah, this is an Apple. This is that. Um, you know, people point out, hey, it takes time. It's slow. Like it's true. And, and what'll happen over time is you can start making. You can one use a bigger model to train a smaller model that's much faster. Two is the bigger models become more efficient. And well, and, and even as as we've learned with uh, uh, GPT's coding skills, I mean, 
like uh, you, you could code faster and correct faster uh, by having robots do the robots do the robots. Uh, that's extraordinary. Um, have they made any claims about when this would be available or anything? They have a plan, which you can go look at their website, which I don't think they have any specific date as to when they're, I think they're probably going to be, you know, one of the things you do with robotics is you'll often find company partners and do try things experimentally to put them into different plants and stuff. So they have their master plan, the roadmap, which is talking about their, their goals of what they're trying to do. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the long road plan is, you know, <laughs> you got to read the, there are three, three major business opportunities in the long term as a Vangelis track plays in the background. So go to figure.ai master plan, uh, the slash master plan. Sure. And I just need you to show this. Okay. Uh, figure.ai slash master plan is coming up. Hyphen right plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, master plan. Okay. Uh, are they going, oh, nope. Maybe I, oh, uh, uh, I did some WWWs at the beginning. Maybe that shouldn't have been there. There we go. Dr. Chiron in the chat says, the robot uh, throws away trash and does dishes already more uh, uh, useful than my kids. Master dash plan? F-I-G-U-R-E. Yeah. Got it. Master dash plan. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, scroll down, and you'll see. Okay. There'll be a black box. I want you to see that. Okay. Here, let me get this the right size. Uh, three major business opportunities for the long term. We got uh, physical labor. That makes sense. Uh, 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 consumer household. Doing the things you don't want to do, uh, keeping things, you know, let the dogs out, feed them, all that stuff. Oh, my God. Off world. <laughs> <laughs> they are not messing around. <laughs> let, wait for the Nexus 6 models for that. I think they'll be really yeah, capable right? there. <laughs> uh, so, but that is, we, we, we're really having trouble grasping right now. What does it mean to have abundant AI? You know, we, we live in. GPT-4 came out a year ago. Now we have GPT-4, OpenAI, probably not sitting around, but we have uh, Gemini Ultra. We have Claude 3. Uh, Claude 3, I think, is a very capable model. And next year, there's going to be even more capable models. We're going to get these things in even more places, and the, and the the stuff that you run on devices be incredible. And we're still trying to – what does that mean? I talk to people now who we work with ChatGPT all day long using this. Yeah. When we start talking about robotics, and one of the things, as you know, about robotics is once you get to a certain state with robotics, your labor cost for building robots goes down because your robots can help you build them. Right. And that's a very interesting factor because where where would you want robots? And we could talk about you know what it means for labor economics, but the I'm writing an article about this, but like my short thesis is this is that when you have this kind of increases in efficiency and productivity, the surface of the area of the economy grows so much more faster. You actually have higher employment opportunities than you did before. Yeah. What does it mean on a personal level? You know, anybody who has older family members, how would it be nice to, you know, have a robot in the house to help them to take oh, care I, of stuff? I, I, and, uh, oh, man, and, and that goes for more than just doing menial labor. It also goes for like, uh, 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 hey, robot, one of your jobs is to, you know, I'm worried about my life partner. Uh, they have these medical conditions. Uh, will you please let text me? I would like to be able to leave the house and go to the grocery store without being terrified that I'm going to come back and my life partner is dead. And instead, you know, you get a text saying, uh, I have seen signs of whatever. Um, uh, all, all of that sounds so uh, ex machina and so terrifying, but also at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, I'll buy one. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I had this idea because uh, we are just coming out of what at one time was one of our favorite weeks of the year, the quote unquote 
tech week of South by Southwest. And in a bygone era, that was the place where you would debut new websites, apps, stuff like that. It was very much a town square for uh, a lot of the tech press and VCs. Uh, that has kind of faded out. Tech week has kind of become media week. So you have a lot of people promoting new movies and television shows, but you don't see the same kind of buzz for tech stuff. I had this thought today. I wonder if next year that's going to be different. If, if, if the good old days are going to be back, because I think uh, one year from today, it, it's we're going to see a lot of the fruits of the post AI post LLM kind of world. And I wouldn't be shocked if somebody decides to use it or a lot of people decide to try to say, Hey, this is real estate that launched Twitter, helped launch Facebook, help launch a lot of these different, uh, uh, big companies. You can get a lot of different people to think a lot of different cool things. If you are the buzz of Sixth street, you know, for five days in March. Well, and, and, uh, I would imagine that a full on, a full on droid walking down Sixth street, having conversations with people walking in, ordering drinks, delivering things, uh, Turn some heads. Uh, it, it, it would be worldwide news, and there's no reason it can't be done. Yeah, uh, 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 Daniel J. Newman says that AI was big at CES. Yes, and everything's big at CES because <laughs> CES is about selling microwaves and televisions. Uh, not to say that CES isn't really important. It is really important, but it's it's important for a different sector. Uh, the, the audience at CES is not only the press, but really buyers, people that are looking to fill different areas of uh, uh, need for them. It's not consumer and it's not just about customer acquisition. Uh, South by was, oh my God, are you on blank? And nine times out of 10, it was a thing that you would maybe use for a little bit during the South by event. But one, yeah, we, you and I signed up for Twitter back in like 2000. Exactly. Saturday. But like sometimes oh, yeah. it's Twitter. Sometimes it's like it, it's really, really it's Foursquare. It's it's a lot of these uh, uh, apps that were really, really important. Uh, uh, I, you know, I uh, think uh, big, big apps like looped, you know, <laughs> like like who, whoever I, muskrat, yeah, whoever, whoever, uh, uh, whoever would go on after that thundering failure. Oh, sometimes the, the real talent rises from the ashes there. <laughs> so. There's, I think, yeah, I think there's something to that. There's a term that's being used around the Valley right now among venture capitalists, which is American dynamism, which is the idea of investing in American companies that are, you know, building things based on core strengths, technology, et cetera, what have you. And there's a number of companies now that are newer companies as we watch, you know, a Boeing wither in the wind and slowly deteriorate in reputation, et cetera. You know, you have, you know, Andrew Palmer Lucky's defense technology company, which came in and it's been disruptive because they're uh, building technology that seems to be more effective, more cost effective than the, the traditional defense partners. Uh, they got criticized because like uh, Andrew's slogan is fight unfair. <laughs> and uh, they've got their now they're building like stealth jets and other stuff like this, kind of like really cool tech. And then there's other companies like that. And I think a lot of these robotics companies, which are, are U.S. based, and there is there is this interest of the idea of like, can you can robotics and stuff lead you to building up a manufacturing might? You know, it, it's very so. Yeah, I think to your point about South by, I think yeah, I think that could be a thing where we might start to see a lot of this stuff showcased because some of these things you want to see in person. But I will say we are in this phase now of. There is having followed as you have technology for years. Yeah, we are in a miracle per week phase now, and yes. I would say that last week, the thing that caught everybody's attention was or early, maybe an earlier week was Devon, which is a new coding tool, which is basically runs like you just tell it build this application, and it's agent based, goes online, finds the things it needs to do, goes and builds the code, runs tests on it, corrects it, fix it. And then finishes with a in theory finished code. Now their examples to me are like, well, there's the problem is these are toy apps. They like build a game of life website, which I'm like, man, that was one of the first demos I did with GPD with the code yeah. capability for GPT-4 was game of life as a little thing. This is way more sophisticated, but 
that company, you know, really caught people by storm because software developers were thinking, well, I'm, I could use GPT-4. I use a tool called Cursor, which is a, co a, a you know, basically an environment where um, I could actually do a demo if you wanted to see this, but it's pretty cool because basically I have my, my development environment for writing code and I have my sidebar where I can chat with ChatGPT and I can then say, hey, write a, write a server app that does blankety blank and it says, okay, here's what I can do. And I click, okay, run. And it starts to write the code into the other window and I can run it and I can say, change this and it will go back line by line and find the spot to change it. So that's a tool called Cursor which took the co-pilot idea that Microsoft yeah. had and went even further. And we're only a year into this folks. Yeah. I, I, I think to me, you're, you're right. Miracle a week is probably a good way to put it. Uh, we are in a development cycle that is similar to the, the early internet, uh, but sped up. Like like the the the, the, well, the the capabilities, the speed, and the money, and the talent, and the and the pool of people that want to push this forward are all so much larger. Uh, uh, not to mention that that the fundamental change, the tech that is that is actually going to shift everything, is is quick and getting quicker. Uh, you know, the the, the question so, is exactly how much it costs to do who's subsidizing it and, and uh, uh, how that will continue to, uh, to, to, to become more efficient. So uh, this week was the one year anniversary of the release of GPT four. Right. Yeah. And uh, one of my friends still at open AI texted me and said that like, it feels like three years ago. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like open AI time is very different from other time. Like when I started there, like 2020 feels like 10 years ago to me yeah. because just the release cycle um, so the, the Sora, the video generator, how yes. long ago was that announced? Sora, I would uh, hazard to say somewhere between six months. No, I mean, I, I think, I think, uh, probably about a uh, five weeks ago, four weeks ago, yep. four weeks ago, four yeah. weeks ago. So, but it, it's, it's the subject of like, it feels like we've been, we know about this thing for months now because the talk about it. And then I get the, I've, I've had, I've had some days with, you know, back to back calls like one hour later trying to explain, you know, industry implications for generative AI, you know, then doing late night calls. Like I had one call that literally I got noticed 30 minutes before. Can you do a consultation call? Cause these people really want to know what doing. And you're watching that impact that these things happen. So like, like I said, it is, it is a miracle a week phase right now. And yeah, I, I think the, in terms of people who are following the bleeding edge of it, there's no doubt that this is going really, really fast. The question is exactly what is the life cycle in terms of it breaking into the mainstream and what does that mean? You know, what, 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 is, the, what is the floor for what we would consider to be a successful AI-powered application? Like, is it that it makes money? Is it that it could, you know, uh, exponentially explode and, and become something far bigger? Like... Uh, uh, and, and what is, what's the gold standard prize, right? Like back in the day, in the, in the early days of the internet, we had understandings of like, okay, if Google is on good morning America, it matters, right? If, if, uh, 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 uh you know, getting a book delivered to your house is on 2020 is or 60 minutes, it, it, it matters. What is that now? Like, I don't even know what it is. I mean, uh, uh, to to use Silicon Valley speak, uh, like, what is the killer app for AI? And now, of course, AI is many things, but what is the thing that everybody could instantly understand? I need that. Let's go. Well, it's it's interesting too because like when the the conversation, the, the topic that comes up repeatedly when I speak to VCs now is. They're trying to figure out what will be a business five years from now because they look at how quickly AI can replace stuff and things be, all of a sudden become just features. Yeah. Because that's part of it is the idea is that they go like, yeah, this is cool. Hey, we got this company here that's built their generative AI thing. Is OpenAI going to come out with something that's just going to blow it out of the water, you know, whatever? I'm like, well, and like I'm the generative AI space. The advice I give is like OpenAI showed Sora. Google has amazing people working on video generation. They've all of a sudden been the 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 reason Sora did the, the reason Sora is as good as it is is partially it has to do with one that's compute, but it's basically 
they used a different approach, which is breaking up each frame into separate space-time regions, et cetera. But there's a new approach out there that shows really good results. Meta wants to do video. So you're just going to see these things where for smaller companies, people trying to get in there, like you, I've had people asking me like, you know, what is the consumer space for generative AI? And I'm like, it's, it's I'm like, I don't know. Like, like, like there, there's, everybody's going to be building these tools into what they do. And man, it's hard. Like I just move so fast. I, uh, I mentioned this before, but I just have this this core uh, uh, feeling that, uh, 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 and, and we don't have to talk about this if that's not what you're into, but it's like we're all about to become either pioneers or poets. Either you're going to stay on Earth and you better be a poet and you better tell better stories that to earn your place here in this Petri dish or you could go out and do labor and uh, expand off the planet. Um, in my mind, it was always a hundred year task, a hundred year phenomenon. But Andrew, Justin, it feels closer than ever to me right now. I mean, what, maybe 20 years? I don't, yeah, timelines are really, really hard because there's, I'll give you a hypothetical. I was talking to somebody the other day about a company that was built a product that's really good for the legal industry. It's a really useful product that can revolutionize the legal industry. The problem they're having is nobody there wants to use it because they have all their fears, some unfounded, some realistic, whatever, and it could radically improve that industry, but the adoption rate is really slow. Uh, Sam Altman's made the point that we're going to achieve, we're likely to achieve AGI or ASI, ASI, on a much sooner timeline than anybody had really thought, but the implementation, the point at which it starts to affect the world around us is going to take longer. So uh, I don't, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that we're gonna be, you know, dropping a thousand figure AI robots on Mars before we try to build a bigger human habitat. You know, we'll, we'll put some people on there, have them go in there, do a touchdown, whatever. But then I think we're going to leave the robots there to do the long term building and stuff. I, I think you want to. I, and, but when is that time? Is that twenty years? Maybe. I mean, there, there's, there's. I don't see a technical limitation to that happening. You know, we just had Starship work. We had that. I mean, Elon not wanting figure A on there because it competes with the Tesla Optimus robot. That's a possibility. Who knows? But um, well, I mean, let, let's let's understand what twenty years is. Uh, twenty years ago today, we were talking about John Kerry's Swift boat. <laughs> like that that seems like a very long time ago. That was also five years before we almost destroyed our friendship arguing about space elevators and reusable <laughs> rockets. That's how far along ago that is. So it's well, like it wasn't destroy our friendship, Brian, because we would still want to go, who can I argue with about space elevators with? Oh, no, no, no. Or, you know what? I say destroy, but maybe what I mean is <laughs> finally bonded. Yeah. <laughs> forged <laughs> forged the respect through combat. Yes, exactly. But, but that, that, that brings up what that brings up. Well, we'll bring this one up again. Uh, but the point, because that the, the contention kind of came from was, you know, my, my position was, I don't think there's technically a problem with this thing working. I just don't, th I think the number of people that have to buy into it for it to happen just will never happen. And that's one of the things you have to think about adoption is to say that we could have this amazing thing, but you have to get a lot of people to buy in. And a lot of people who are often justifiably hesitant because you don't want, well, so-and-so said it works, so I'm all, we're all going to do it. I think that that's a big factor. But yeah, I think that we we are the the three pillars that I think that we need we'll put one is ASI artificial superintelligence that is a we're on a glide path towards where I think we keep doing what we're going to be doing we're going to get to there okay robotics I think the idea of getting robots that are human level dexterous and you've seen you've seen the thing like Boston Dynamics does etc the problem they have is they they seem to be really good at building these machines one off, not so good at figuring out how to manufacture them at low cost. But that that's going to take some bottlenecks to break through. But I think that like human human dexterous level robotics, which seems possible. The third thing is really is energy is cheap energy production, which is fusion. I am 
said this before, I'm very optimistic that we are going to have commercially viable fusion by the end of this decade. And, and you know, the, the, the adage goes, well, we've always been, it's always been 20 years away. Like, yeah, it was a government project for the last, you know, 60, 70 years. Those are the only people investing, you know, more than a few million dollars into fusion was the government. And it was only the DOE, which was dedicated towards building a Takamak reactor design, which the original designers knew 40 years ago that would not be a commercially viable thing towards fusion. It's a good thing to experiment with. So I'm very bullish. We'll have that. But does that mean if all of a sudden, you know, next year, Helion, whatever, flips on their new reactor, their fusion reactor, and it's energy positive and whatever, that everything, our energy grid problems are solved? No, because you have to build millions of these things. You have to get them out there into the grid and the world and finance them and have the electrical power support that can support that. And that's hard. And But that's the kind of thing where if you have robots, it gets easier. So uh, – uh... Uh, I, 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 I know we're about to have to move into picks, but it's like, uh, I think to myself, uh, uh, a lot of people are afraid of AI replacing them. Um, when, uh, m most of them are really just afraid of having to be in charge of other things. Right. Uh, so, uh, let's say, let's say, uh, uh, Everybody gets a, a UBI happens and let's say every human, like at this point, all energy concerns, all everything's uh, concerns are handled by robots and uh, uh, by, uh, for sake of argument, let's say solar power or fusion or what have you. Um, I can truly picture a world where it's like every human is assigned a uh, a few robots and it's up to you to decide what kind of clever things you want your robots to do that will benefit not the other robots, but other humans. Uh, because at, at the end of the line, all we want to do is please each other and, and make uh, everybody else happier. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Maybe that's too Pollyanna. Um, I, I think the challenge is that, you know, we're, we're burdened by what what's came before us and what we know about now, and it's hard for. I, I think that at that point you're, we're going to be kind of post robotics, which I could go into a whole other show. What I mean by that, but uh, wait, th uh, that that's where we get into nano land and yeah, and and, and yeah, and how much of the material in the world is scaffolding that we don't really. And there, yeah, there's a yeah, there's a whole other discussion about that, but. Um, that is, that is a concern though. Whenever I post something about AI, whatever on my Twitter feed, I get people respond who are like, now that the anti-robot people are coming forward. It was, it was funny in science fiction. We'd be like, who'd be opposing robots? Well, those people have emerged now and they're, they're anti this. And it's just, and it's it, on one hand, it's easy to sort of like, cool, but you're cool with electricity. Should we get rid of that? But there are people generally afraid because one is that they see, you know, AI generative art is being displacing to artists, although the really talented artists I know are doing exceptionally well and really know how to use it. But that doesn't mean the fear is not real. I think that people are looking at the idea of, you know, Justin and I were talking about this, is that when they start putting robots in supermarkets to restock shelves, people are going to lose their heads because that's going to be frustrating. And because every time they see a robot out in real space doing a job a human did, they're going to assume there's some human somewhere that did not get that job, which may be true. The the and it's hard for people to understand, you know, it's it's you know, you, when people you know are like, we should, you know, Bernie Sanders is like, we should only work 32 hours a week and minimum wage should be $50 an hour. Those are great ideas. What is the economic reality of that? Like, you know, do you think fast food is too expensive now? <laughs> do you think this is? But also, it's not the answer is to say, ah, keep people poor and don't, you know, make them overwork. But and it, it, these are complex things. It's hard to sort of unpack them when people only look at it from one thing or their worldview is limited. That being said, where where do we go? You know, what what does the future look like? And and I could see a world where the, the beautiful thing about robotics is having lived in and traveled through developing countries where people can't afford proper housing because their their economic output doesn't justify the economics output that it takes to build a house or to do this thing on a pure one-to-one -one ratio, when you lower the cost of that by robotics, it means, man, a lot more housing for people, way more housing for people. You know, when you think about these areas that are late, you go like, well, how can they be labor scarce for so many people? Well, 
if I sell oranges on the street, there's not enough, I can't sell enough oranges to pay for the number of people it takes to build a car. You know what I'm saying? And like with robotics, that changes and those economics get way more interesting. So uh, we can unpack that, I guess, at some other time. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we have like uh, five to seven more episodes to to walk through. I got a feeling this. that this will continue to be at the top of our mind in yes. future weeks. In in the meantime, uh, with the blessing of Patreon.com slash Weird Things, where you can uh, support this show. Well, you got any picks, Mr. Brushwood? Uh I don't know if I've talked about it on this show, but I mentioned it on Cord Killers. I got my wife and daughter to watch Dino De Laurentiis's Flash Gordon. And I did it for one reason. It was so, like, she she was a little bit down. And I'm like, ho, ho, whoa, what are you doing, girl? You got you to gotta summon some better energy. You know what you need? You need to be a little bit Brian Blessed. And she's like, I don't know what that means. And I was like, big old bushy beard, giant mouth that opens like a truckosaurus and just says, <laughs> well, nobody lives forever. Die! <laughs> and so I, I got my wife and my daughter to watch Flash Gordon and, oh boy, uh, it is exactly what it is, but it was a lot of fun to go back and revisit like that kind of unbridled joy. Uh, if, if, if it wasn't last week's picks, uh, it, it's this week's pick. Flash Gordon. Has, has there been like a good doc about the Dino De Laurentiis era? I don't think there yeah. has been. The most adjacent one would have been... Uh, 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 Jodorowsky's Dune or whatever, but but like uh, from what I understand, uh, there's so many weird things about the Flash Gordon movie and Dune, right? So so Dune, David Lynch directed and hated so much that he refused to let his name be attached to it. So he did the Alan Smithy thing, um, uh, 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 which is a way to not have your name associated with the thing. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis also did Conan. He also did uh, uh, Flash King Gordon. Kong. What's that? King Kong. King Kong. Oh, and King Kong. Oh, that's right, where he goes to the Twin Towers. <laughs> uh, uh, he also, uh, but but also during that time, during Flash Gordon, from what I've read, uh, everybody working on set was like, well, this is fun. This is a camp movie. We're, we're just going to go over the top and have fun. Apparently, Dino De Laurentiis was the only one who didn't know he was making a camp movie where everyone was just going to have a lot of fun. Uh, also, Flash Gordon's voice, uh, he he couldn't make it for the ADR session, and so none of that is the actual actor's uh, voice. Yeah. Uh, there is some amazing stuff that kind of came out of there. And like, I think that like, like, like Conan, which I think Conan is like one of the greatest fantasy movies of all time. Um, and that was, uh, John Milius, you know, you know, the story about John Milius and, uh, big Lebowski. No. Oh yeah. That's, uh, the, 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 the uh, John footprint. Goodman's character. Yeah. yeah the footprint yeah. of John Goodman's character is John Milius. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Millie is a fascinating guy, but yeah, like, like there is, we think there's a lot of the super, super cheesy sort of over the top movies that Delantis did. And then there's some, actually some, you know, kind of really incredible ones too. Like sometimes just things got through that, like Serpico. Right. Um, but, uh, I, I loved like Conan's one of my, I think is this amazing. Um, I loved, uh, King Kong. I liked the version that they did the 1976 King Kong version. My Favorite thing about that too was, I don't know if you remember, but De Laurentiis really understood pre pre publicity PR. He really, really had a great grip on that. When they made King Kong, there was footage where they showed this giant mechanical robot, this giant King Kong, which was like half ape suit, like half ape, and then like they had an arm expansion or whatever that was shown, like was open. And they had said, they built a giant 
fully articulated robotic ape to play the part of King Kong. Now, in reality, that thing they built was in for like three seconds of the film, which is the <laughs> arm raise. You can clearly tell it's basically a building with a gorilla suit put on it. But it, I, as a kid, I'm like, oh my God, they can build giant apes now. And that was, that made the press. It's PR. And you sometimes you see stuff like that. I forgot there was something more recent where, you know, they, they get a lot of attention. They did that in Jurassic Park. We're like, oh, it's all CG. It's all CG. The original Jurassic Park, 16 some minutes. CG. What's that? I think it was 16 minutes in the entire movie had CG yeah. in it. And the rest was puppets, puppets, yep. puppets, that stand with some puppets. And, and you know, you, you walk away going, man, that looked realistic. Like, that was a puppet. And so... There was a, I was working at the movie theater as a projectionist, and I know I've told this story, but there is an assistant manager who just said the most wonderful thing that makes my heart happy to this very day. He was like, man, I watched that Jurassic Park, and those, those dinosaurs, they look so real, but I know they can't be real because they didn't have no cameras back then. <laughs> It's amazing. Fair point. Fair point. When you're right, you're right. Uh, uh, my pick is uh, Cursor, which is a development platform for. It's an IDE. It's built on top of the the VS Code platform, whatever the the open source version of that is. Long story short, if you want to write code, you want to do cool stuff. I think Cursor is pretty good. They have a really generous trial period. All of my friends use it. I'm like, man, I'm good using GPT-4 and copy-pasting and doing that. And then I open up Curse, like, ah, I don't want to learn it. And then I'm doing a lot of copy-paste. I'm like, ah, let me try this. And I used it. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so stupid. Like, I ignore this for months because I'm an idiot. So I think I told Sam that. Like, yeah, like, yeah, you know, I don't care. Like, I'm used to using GPT-4. It's not really for me. And he's like, in his head, you like, idiot. <laughs> uh, my pick is Dark Dive. The latest Sloan McPherson mm. book uh, by Andrew Maine. Available on Amazon. Mm. How's, Sounds it, how's it doing, Andrew? So, Brian, what if it was like a critical failure right now and like I was like about to get canceled for it? Um, uh, then so, I would say, Andrew, I'm so glad that I'm your friend now and will always be your friend. Unless... Yeah, what's Unless it was like really gross. Yeah, I uh, listen. I, I listen. To, <laughs> I'm listening to like I, I subscribe to Blinkist, where they they do these things like these uh, the you know, short versions of books because I have a short attention span. And there was one about cannibalism, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, the taboo against cannibalism may not always be in place because you know climate change and oh, stuff. Oh Jesus! And I'm like, I'm like, what? You know, and then you know the next day, Haiti. You know, I was gonna Haiti. say, yeah, is that is that is that a self published by General Barbecue? <laughs> yeah, I was just, but it was just this, there was this funny thing about like, oh, like this taboo. They're like the one of the only remaining taboos. I'm like, no, nah, I can think of a couple other taboos that are yeah. pretty taboo. But it was just this like, like it was a very academic like, who are we to judge? I'm like, I don't know. People that don't want to get eaten. Uh, so uh, uh, back to Dark Dive, which has <laughs> um, I near I, I part of the storyline does take place with something that happened about ten thousand years ago, which I could have involved cannibals if I wanted, but it does not. So yeah, Dark Dive is the fifth book in the Underwater Investigation Unit series featuring Sloan and Pearson. Um, so uh, right now, forty five in the Kindle store. Uh, it's doing four point five stars. Out of five, 259 ratings, a 4.4 on Goodreads, which is actually really good. Um, so uh, very happy with the book, but very happy with the next journey. And the story involves Sloan McPherson, our protagonist, a friend of her family is somebody who she learned a lot of diving skills from, who is a cave diver, has gone missing. And they think he's gone missing in a cave, but there's some suspicious circumstances around that. So she has to go out. And try to find out what's going on and found that he fell in with a group of a bunch of dive rats who like to do cave dives. And there's a big mystery unfolding there. So. Get it. Get it on Amazon.com. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I like that. I like to read reviews that have really nice things by people I've never met. So. There we go. Read it. 
if you like it, make sure you review it. Uh, uh, I mean, so much of uh, Andrew's writing career started right here on this podcast where uh, 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 good-hearted humans like yourself understood that concept of exactly how much a good review matters on uh, those platforms. So please, please, please support the good Mr. Maine. Yes, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, it's been weird. Nailed it. Uh, you want to roll straight into after things, or how much time do we have? Uh, I'm good for time. Okay. Uh, I, I got about 25 minutes, if that works. Sure. Yep. Okay. All right, here we go. In three, two... Hello, Ed. Welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Uh, hello. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello, friend. So, gentlemen, we talked about previously in the episode of Weird Things, we showed the figure AI robot. And robotics are, there's a number of things that are making robotics move very, very quickly. And, and one of them is LLMs, understanding more about feedback mechanisms. And the cost to produce these things is probably going to fall down, is going to drop probably a lot. And that means we're going to see robots in a lot of places, a lot of different places. What, what do you tell people? What do you tell people who are worried or concerned about between AI and robots? We also talk about Devin, which is a code editor, which not, excuse me, a, a basically a AI programmer that can program apps and that that thing, you know, where these things are, where they were two years ago was like a joke. And now where they are now, they're like seriously concerning people and where they're going to be two or three years from now, I think we're going to acceleration point. Um, and that means a lot of other tasks. There's a term that's come about, which is called agents. Agents, if you're not familiar with, agents is when you take something like GPT-4 and you give it a goal and it can go work on the goal, come back and check on it and do it instead of like you just get a chat GPT response. And agents kind of like when you ask it to search the web and it keeps searching, searching until it gets a result. But an agent can be keep writing this thing until it passes this test. Keep doing this thing until you succeed. And so, we're going to that'll be the big buzzword you're going to see in the next year or so as agents. Uh, I, I I have a few metaphor that I like to lean on when I encounter somebody who uh, metaphor time who's, metaphor who's, time. It's like when you have a way to say a thing, but you say something else. Yep. Metaphor. Uh, but I, I would love to hear what Justin, uh, I, uh, when you encounter Justin, uh, somebody who's scared of this stuff, what do you tell them? I mean, it's interesting because I don't have a lot of those people. <laughs> I have I have people that are are uh, uh, feel dumb because they don't know how to use it. Um, but also, I think that that there's an element of society that's become very hardened to that because we've had a lot of quote unquote next big things over the years uh, uh some of which i think are exciting some of which i think are are uh, a lot of hype but either way uh the idea that ai was just going to be another one of those is kind of a cope i think we're we're kind of through that uh, in in a lot of ways now uh but I, I don't have a lot of people that that are like oh well this is going to ruin the world in in my life uh but if i were to meet them uh i would try to do what I've always done with AI, which is understand the tech and not the projection. People's projections about tech are crazy. Very, very smart people have had very, very wildly off-putting or off-base off uh, uh, projections when gigantic money has been on the line. And we saw a lot of those lessons throughout the last big tech boom of the internet. And you had you know, major companies like Google that didn't believe that like storage was going to be a thing and were building part of their company for a post storage world. Uh, and, and that's where, that's where the internet was going to evolve. It was wrong. Uh, do I think that AI is going to affect labor and output? Yes. I also think that personal computers tremendously affected labor and output. I, I feel the internet affected labor and output. Will these have more profound effects? quite possibly, but uh, uh, the best thing that anybody can do is be understanding of it, proficient of it. Uh, uh, this is, this is, 
another time, just like computers and just like the internet, where people who are going to be early on it are just going to have advantages. So, Brian, you successfully procreated. You have one from a Darwinian point of view, and you now have children. You have children that are now getting older and about ready to enter the workforce. What do you tell them? What are your thoughts? Well, they, they have opinions. Maybe that's why. Uh, but Brian's Brian's got uh, people very, very close to him that uh, are very skeptical of AI. Well, and uh, and and have taken a quasi political stance on it, um, uh, and. As a father, I want to be kind. And so I try to, as I've said before, like we all just got a promotion. We are all in management now. We are all project managers. Instead of doing the things, we outline the thing we want done and we get the feedback. And it's like, I need you to be a little bit more like this or a little bit more like that. Basically we're all Steven Spielberg now. And um, some people are comfortable with that and some people are not. And, and that goes in all domains because uh, Andrew, uh, as we've talked about before, like uh, you, you and I are not coders, but we're becoming coders by, by way of just telling computers what to do well, i think main's I, a coder main main I, mean, I got hired as a coder by technology company but <laughs> i mean i would oh, yeah, i yeah, do yeah, a lot yeah. more telling a computer what to do yeah, but yeah, I mean, you yeah. didn't yeah you, know, you ain't got no degree in the you, you get what i'm saying well yeah i, I, I would I, I did to, to, to split hairs i would say that, that now it's become a lot easier for non-technical people to to go in and code and do that stuff but Again, I did get hired and had to do a coding exam and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. Okay. But, uh, but, 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 but I, I just want—I don't want to undersell. Like, yeah, I just showed up and said, "Hey, I could do this thing and use a tech that doesn't exist yet." Remember when I got hired? That it didn't exist. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm projecting back to when. 20 years ago, you and I were both was uh, was not a coder. Was right. Not, I, did not, and yes. I did, not, did not pick up coding until I was like 43, 44 years old. OK. And so but I would say that, too, and, and I, I am a a a yeah, not not a we were back again, back. You know, you, you all watched my journey here. Um, I would say that. I've made this argument too, which is sort of tangential to this was on there's this, you know, you've all hurry like, Oh, nobody don't bother teaching your kids to code AI house. Cause I'm like, to me, that is, I think he's a smart guy. That is the dumbest take possible because coding as I define it is learning how to break something down to the smallest, sim- simplest number of instructions possible to get a system to do a thing. And man, learning to code is a great way to then go look at other processes and stuff. There is, it's not random that half of the most wealthy people in the country were coders. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just, well, they could write the code. Like, no, they could take the code and they could apply that to other processes, which I think is people often want to overlook. It doesn't mean you have to. If you don't want to code, I'm not going to make you code. So I, uh, that's one aspect of the AI revolution is being able to understand that once you know how to code, you begin with first principles. It's like, do you understand zero and one? Good. Now let what if zero and one made something, blah, 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 blah. But uh, meanwhile, it's been fascinating. I would love this Khan Academy, by the way. Uh, 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 Brian's, <laughs> Brian's coding 101. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, there's... Uh, it's been fascinating to watch other people who uh, are figuring out what what they're going to get out of AI. Like, for example, uh, Bonnie does not want AI to write her uh, correction email for, uh, I don't know, like bad behavior at an art event. However, she does want AI to evaluate the letter that she wrote for am I coming across as too hostile? Yeah. What are ways for me to make this better? And 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 that that is one of the extraordinary things. It is, it is, I have heard so many people tell me this, that that's the way, like my wife's talked about this. Other people say that, like, yeah, I want to use it to make sure my language or whatever. And I think that to me, and I want your take, Brian and Justin, like that tells me that we really want 
some sort of neutral or some party out there to sort of help us be better or speak better or do that. And that's a very interesting space AI could get into. Well, and- well, yeah, I, I, I think I've always joked that, you know, the Internet is where context goes to die. But in reality, it's just text. Uh, text is where context goes to die and that very oftentimes our emotions as we go into it, be they elated, uh, uh, you know, disappointed, angry, they can get misconstrued, especially if you're trying to write even keel. Uh, uh, and, and that's where I don't think we trust ourselves. And by the way, we shouldn't. Because it's very hard to judge your own product when it comes to stuff like that, unless you are somebody who spent a lot of time writing and thinking about writing and clarity. Like I, on, on the stream this morning that I did, I spent a lot of time just talking about like news writing. Like what are the points of news writing? Because there was a, an article, a political article that I, I had problems with things that were the way that they were written. And ultimately, the only two North Stars of news writing are brevity and clarity. That's it. Can I write it shorter? Can I write it clearer? When the answer to those are no, you've got, you know, hopefully something close to a finished product. Uh, If any time there's something that you can make clearer or make shorter, that's something that you want to do. What we want is an editor. What we want is somebody to look over our shoulder and say, yeah, uh, uh, that's good. Maybe you should consider doing this or this is coming off as harsh. Like uh, uh, whether or not it is uh, going to get you to the exact place you want to go who knows but is it something that makes us feel better and gives us a restrictor plate so we can maybe be angry and then say make this less angry that's great if it gets you to finish it so i there's a mutual friend that all three of us have uh who was expressing that he uh wants to expand his ability to tell stories and is maybe a little bit fatigued on the way he has been telling stories. And, uh, and I asked uh, whether or not they had considered AI, and the immediate pullback you know, was, was, no, I don't want an AI to do my job. And I was like, bup, 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 bup. Uh, you don't need an AI to do your job. He's like, what he expressed was, what I want is to train somebody to be able to write in my voice and to make this easier and all that. And I was like, have you, because you've done everything yourself up until now, have you written a style guide? And he's like, no, it just sounds like, Hey, you know what the AI can do? It can read and listen to everything you've ever done. And it can, write a style guide and then you'll look at the style guide because the AI is pretty much a, you know, a recently graduated undergrad. You can correct it. And now you have a style guide and now you can use the humans for the things you want to do. And it will take much less time. Uh, it's, um, I, 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 I think that there's a bit of a blind spot that a lot of humans experience when it comes to the subject. Yeah, I think you you can tell how much experience people have when playing with it because in, in some don't. And sometimes you, you hear about it, you just dabble a little bit like, ah, I don't get it or it's not for me. And then you move on and then you come back to need to do a thing and you start finding other ways to use it. My favorite thing, I saw this the other day, I wanted to frame this, was on a Hacker News comment about uh, opening. I added some new function because they have an agents thing that's able to do streaming. It's not really important, but there was a commenter there who says like this site is now like 30% people talking about autocomplete. I really hope that we move on from this, you know, as we realize that that's all these functions are doing boring. And I'm like, is this a parody? Is this a person that like literally thinks that like GPT four, all it does is just have a bunch of stored things that it just fills in. And, and that's what's going on here. Cause like kind of a maze. It's almost like a flat earther now. And I, yeah, I mean, I think that, that's, that's, that's the hipster take. That's the hipster take that I do think is on its way out of like, like, Oh, AI, like, uh, metaverse much. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah. I'll be happy when this AI fad moves on. It's like, no, dude, yeah, well, sometimes, they, they sometimes it's, it's the like, internet. Oh, the latest thing, like Bitcoin. And I was like, Oh, like, like, 
Yeah, because, you know, you remember how your mom was telling you how great that that Bitcoin app was and how all those D apps were so useful. It's the same thing. It was just like, no, like that was, you know, a speculative thing based upon one. It made it easier to, you know, gamble and buy drugs. And there's a huge market for that and a lot of speculation about it for other things. But it wasn't like they're like, man, this microtransaction service that was built on the blockchain made my life easier. It's a very different thing. But I think. I, I I wish I had better words to explain to people. Uh, Use what, a metaphor. It's fine, Brian. You're allowed. Well, I, 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 what I tend to do is I say, look, there's a wave coming. You're either going to be surfing it or you're going to wonder what happened. That's that's about as far as I go. And then after that, I, I'm just climbing uphill against their prejudices. Um, uh, it, 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 what What do you guys say about it? I mean, I, I, I'm never going to arm, never going to twist an arm. I, I will, I have to find the thing that's useful for them. If I want to, if I think it'll be helpful for them, I try to find that task, that thing is useful for them, you know, for, you know, my brother-in-law is an accountant it's showing them, Hey, there are these things called macros in Excel. You can use this to write macros and macros can save you a lot of time. You can always use chat to explain to you what macros are doing. Oh, that's very good. Andrew, like to skip explaining anything and cut right to the heart of like, uh, what do you want? Hello, I'm a genie. What do you want? And then it's like, just solve it right there for them and explain. I mean, I, I, I do think that in terms of uh, a wide scale adoption of uh, AI, that we're going to look at chat, the chat interface that we see now is very, very primitive. Um, you know, th there's a lot of context that I think people need to fill. There's a lot of scaffolding that's not there right now that right now people that are into it are either technically inclined and can understand the tech enough to be uh, wowed by it. And there is a utilitarian premise, especially in things like coding. For me, it's summarization. Summarization uh, and transcription has become uh, absolutely essential to my daily life. Uh, and a, my, and a, my career. a pair of outside eyes to evaluate what, what you're no. doing. No, like literally just take an article, summarize it down in new script, something that I was doing by hand, right? Now all of a sudden that takes uh, uh, seconds as opposed to me having to read the article. I mean, I still read the article fully, but uh, uh, to to uh, write it out. Now, boom, 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 already done. Uh, and transcription. I now, PX3 is a video show now. It was never a video show before. And that happened because of a few technical things in terms of, lighting and cameras, but uh, the reason why is because of transcription uh, that is AI powered. What, uh, what, what do you use for transcription? Everything runs through Riverside. It's all on the back end. It's, it's built in. Yeah. So I just so, record. So, so, when I'm done recording, it, it has a transcript. That's what helps create the social media clips that I'm able to pop out. They have cool inline editing things that I don't think are necessarily AI stuff. But like, for example, the State of the Union, State of the Union, in terms of pulling stuff, kind of a pain in the ass, uh, uh, especially if you're not like on it. Like if I'm not like going back and recording stuff or I need to watch it, take notes and then keep a loose time code on it so I can go back and find the clips that I want. I took notes during the State of the Union. Next day, I was going to do my episode, uploaded the entire State of the Union to Riverside because of the transcription, I can just search the quotes that I already written down in my notes. So I'm punching out 10 second, 15 second, two minute clips, whatever I need in seconds. Like this is a marriage of one thing that I, uh, uh, to Andrew's great chagrin, uh, never really wanted to get into, which was video editing. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, uh the idea of, uh, uh, you know, cutting stuff out by words that does not currently exist in top of the line video editors. You know, this this is really, really for me revolutionary stuff, and and the fact that it can pop out with words underneath it without the the, the versatility there is huge. So, uh, I have found without much prodding two things that have exponentially made me more efficient and made my product better. Uh, 
I these things will only continue to happen. And I'm somebody who's paying more attention to it than the average person. Nor are some of these tools even built for me. So uh, uh, this is Riverside, a podcasting app. Uh, 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 Andrew, uh, uh, you had suggested Descript. Is 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 there a, a big difference between the two when it comes to transcribing stuff? So Descript is good when you already have your content recorded and you want to drop it in. Um, and Riverside's good if you want to record the conversation. Descript is used a lot for post. Descript is often a lot. It, it depends really what you want to do, like what kind of transcription you want to get, whatever. What I did for our uh, our tool that we did, our podcast uploaders, I just used a service called Deepgram, where I just you know threw the file at it and it gave us a transcription. Um, I'm going to play with a different one that's going to have speaker diarization, which it should break the different speakers out into different people. Um, but it really comes down to what level you want to do it, where you want to just throw it in and get a transcript. Um, I have a tool on my Mac called Mac Whisper, which uses the uh, the OpenAI Whisper model, and I just drop a file in there and I get a transcript. Yeah. No, there, and that's that's the thing is it's not that it can happen. What our future is going to be is the perfect app for you. That will exist. Like the the idea of delving into niche markets on a level that are going to be easier to build, faster to build, and and get you exactly what you need. Boy, we're we're just we're in we're in we're in preseason still. We're, I mean, what, we're not wait, even wait, wait, we're not even in it. What are we like five five years away from all having our own personal Jarvis, and then uh, six years away from that Jarvis being able to say, "Hey, we just got the dailies back from the polls that we sent out on how your takes landed on whatever." Uh, uh, recommend blank. Well, you could, what's, we mentioned before agents, like right now there's not a real consistently clear path and the best way to sort of build these systems that come together. There's a lot of open source projects that try to do this it's kind of goal seeking and they're neat and then they break, they're, they're brittle, but you can do so much right now with a GPT-4 level model or whatever the long context that we're not that far away. It, it literally kind of comes down to somebody saying, oh, oh, it's worth the effort for me to just take a thing and just one, take your existing content, then produce show notes for you for what you should do in your next show. You record it, then it goes through and edits it. You could build that now. Like the AI is good enough to do it. You just have to, you know, that one of the things that's going to happen is these AI systems get even smarter. You're going to have to build less code to do it because you'll just feed it all your video and then you won't even need a special app to do it. It's good stuff. Uh, any picks? Uh, yeah, I saw uh, Poor Things What Emma Stone won for uh, Best Actress. It's a weird flick, friends. Weird flick. Uh, I actually thought that it uh, it paired well with Barbie. Um, <laughs> two very, very different takes on a uh, woman coming from a realm that we did not quite understand uh, and going on a journey based on what society wants and needs from them. Uh, two very, very, very different journeys, but uh, uh, in that they share uh, a similarity. Although there's no Ken. Really, what makes Barbie worth watching is Ken uh, in terms of uh, that that storyline, but uh, uh, there's not... There's Discovering no the Patriot Agency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I liked it. I mean, it's it's weird. It, it's, it's a super... It, like, there are some... <laughs> A man reanimates a woman who committed suicide by putting a child's brain in her head, and that's not the moral quandary that everybody that I've talked to about the movie wants to talk about the most. <laughs> like, so th there's there's a lot of just go with it in in at least the uh, the moral questions. Yeah, it's a it's a plot line straight out of a manga where nobody's going. We you know, like so. Interesting. Uh, uh, I went back and I watched uh, Wes Anderson's Rushmore, and number one, super duper holds up. Number two, um, 
it 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 inspired a feeling in my gut that I never expected to feel where I was like pleased that my daughters were watching it because kind of the underlying message is school is BS. And uh, that's not something we've talked a lot about on here. And maybe we'll save this for another time, but I didn't mind. I didn't mind my 16 year old (laughs) watch a movie about how school is BS. It's an interesting take on it. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would, yeah, I love the movie. I thought it was more about like prestige for the sake of prestige. Cause you know, in the end he goes to the normal school and he's very happy cause he's got his friend groups and he's still doing great plays and stuff. Well, and, and, and also about- it's like the, the, there are themes, especially in the first act where uh, it's fascinating to watch a 15 year old act like a 28 year old, you know? Um, uh, uh, but also he very clearly is learning and no, he's not learning at the, the pace, the rate, or in the style that Rushmore Academy wants him to. But meanwhile, you know, Bill Murray, who has made it and is a wealthy millionaire and uh, I guess, you know, and is giving money to Rushmore, recognizes, I don't know, it's, um, did I mention I have three daughters in their teens now? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Groovy. So my pick is it's on a lark for some reason. I think it started with Brian with you bringing up the, uh, the be useful book by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm one of these people that just kind of goes dip- deeper. Haven't read it. I'll take a look at it at some point, but I'm like, man, I haven't watched, I haven't watched Pumpy and iron in a while. Pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Yeah. So those of you who don't know, Pumping Iron was a documentary about the 1975 Mr. Olympia, which was significant because uh, Arnold had gotten out of bodybuilding because he was now pursuing acting. He did, did the movie Stay Hungry and was getting more acting opportunities. But they did a book called Pumping Iron, which is a very successful book about the culture of bodybuilding and Arnold it was a big feature in it. And they realized they needed, if they're going to do a documentary about bodybuilding, and it's not, it's a drama, it's a docudrama, it's not really accurate. But if you want to do a story about bodybuilding and real people, you need to have Arnold Schwarzenegger in it because he was the superstar of bodybuilding. And so they get Arnold, Arnold decides he's going to come back into it, he's going to go back and compete in the Mr. Olympia again. Um, and, you know, they, they introduced like Lou Frigno as if like nobody's seen this guy before, or whatever. They, they competed against him and knew who he was. And that was a long, long standing thing. But you get, you know, a very young Lou Frigno who's in, you know, humongous is giant Arnold playing the character of just this. You know, if he asks me on the competition day for advises, I will give them all the wrong advises. And mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just but Arnold, Arnold being very charismatic, playing a bit of a bit of a villain to an extent, but you'd still root for him and want him to win because he is the most high agency person in there. And that, I think we, that's a, we can have a conversation about it some other time about what we might agency because that is really, an, you know, I, interesting fact. Just to get back to Arnold. So. I was ha- I was hanging out with a, a friend of ours who, uh, out of shame for this sin that I'm about to confess to you all, I will not say his name, but he has seen like no movies in general. But he's in a phase now where he's watching a lot of movies, and so I'm like, you know, we we wind up getting on. He confused Total Recall for Demolition Man. He had not seen either. Uh, he apparently at one time was trying to talk to a friend about watching Demolition Man. They uh, watched Brendan Fraser get taken out of the ground, and Polly Shore was there, and they found out that they were watching Encino Man. <laughs> Devil Encino Man. Which, when you think about it, they both involve people getting taken out of a fish out of water time stories, different time periods. But but I was I was just talking about all these Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm like, like oh, so yeah, no, Total Recall, and I'm explaining the plot of Total Recall, and I'm like, and of course, Terminator, and, and then it's like, yeah, that's actually when like Arnold at his best is is like Arnold in these big science, these lore heavy science fiction or fantasy uh, uh, worlds where you're just like like he is just a vessel. He's a perfect vessel for all that creativity. 
Well, it's it's interesting too because you look back at the time when uh, here's this guy, bodybuilder, thick accent, whatever, and the guy he'd, he'd already at this time he'd already done like Hercules Goes Bananas, where they had to dub his voice and he played as Arnold Strong, uh, <laughs> and you're we're watching Arnold smoke a joint with his Arnold as numero <laughs> no t-shirt. <laughs> uh, there's a documentary that came out too, which was about like 25 years later yeah. where they talk about that and like, Oh, did you smoke? He's like, I smoked, I inhaled, I did everything. Um, the thing too, that comes to Oh, steroids. Like, yeah, like steroid use was very open that time because steroids hadn't been, cla- been declared a banned substance at that point. And you could just get like, you know, Di- Diana Bull is a prescription. So, Yes, they're all using steroids because it was just another thing you could pick up at the pharmacy and do. And it wasn't until a few years later. It was, that it was like vitamins. Be- By the way, have y'all yeah, heard about it, have, it, you, have y'all heard about the enhanced games? Wait, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Hold on, I, 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 what wasn't this a bit from SNL? <laughs> yes, yes, and <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, all steroids legal. They are going to have doctors. If you are competing, they will have <laughs> they will have doctors to supervise to make sure, from their perspective, that you're not going to explode. But you are you are allowed to dope yourself with with whatever, and they hope to shatter Olympic records. So, two things. Uh, one is steroids are still poorly understood as far as like in the public consciousness there was like a vice documentary talking about here's the, the video of the the all steroid olympics <laughs> <laughs> so uh one thing i saw this vice documentary like oh what's killing these pakistani bodybuilders and and they talk about this guy who had been you know was using steroids he died like three days after the competition it's like that probably wasn't the steroids that killed him. That was the diuretics. That was, you know, the, the thing oh, to uh, remove all cut, the water. Cutting his body by uh, uh, losing all of all the liquids that are water. supposed to yeah, run a and, body. And that's, <laughs> that's happened a number of bodybuilders who die around competition time is because exactly that, Brian. And, and that's a thing like, oh, say steroids. Like, no, steroids are a much slower well, if you abuse them sort of thing. And, and that's, but it's a harder narrative. Do you know about, you know about insulin in bodybuilding? Uh, uh, I, I, I believe, uh, tell me the, so you ever seen that gut and I won't name certain <laughs> very large, uh, wrestler turned actors and maybe box guys who play boxers and stuff. It's called bubble gut. You see that kind of that, 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 that they get muscular yeah. the gut. That's one of the causes of that is actually insulin because you can inject yourself with insulin and it boosts your protein production and so all of a sudden you're able to build more muscle because of that and if you put it in that abdominal cavity it actually increases the fatty tissue in there so like you people think like there's steroids and people know about there's human growth or well, there's also use of insulin there's like all these crazy sorts of things that one it's why when you watch some of these bodybuilding competitions these people just look like look like michelin men it's just weird but my pick pumping iron 1975 and if you're really curious there is follow the 1980 Olympia when Arnold, while training for Conan, decided he was going to re-enter the Mr. Olympia contest to prove that he had it with like two months worth of training, and he won. <laughs> he was also a sponsor of the Mr. Olympia contest. Oh, and number of people boycotted Mr. Olympia next year, and Franco Colombo won <laughs> Arnold's best friend. So. uh bit of a controversy it was a thing that and you get people like oh like that ruined you see somebody body was like i think it ruined bodybuilding i'm like oh in defense arnold made bodybuilding yeah. so it's kind of you know it's because he realized the calves are like the biceps of the legs <laughs> there's a funny funny thing in in the pumping iron where uh I don't know. It's Ken Wall or whatever. They're out. They're out. That like the, this rock posing, doing these poses and stuff. And Arnold's up there posing. Arnold was notorious for his leg stuff. And Arnold's doing his big muscular chest pose. You hear somebody go, "Yeah, they won't notice the legs." <laughs> so, gentlemen, it's been after. Oh yeah! All right. Uh, shutting off the stream. We love you, people. Party people!